Welcome to What Congress Needs to Know About Judea Samaria, the latest installment of Zoom with ZOA. We have two co-sponsors today. We have uh, the North Carolina Coalition for Israel, and we have the Raleigh Carey Jewish Community Center. So I'd like to welcome everybody from down south. For those of you who haven't been on a webinar with us here at ZOA, please leave your microphones on mute. At the end of the program, uh, we will be doing a Q&A and questions will be asked through the Zoom chat feature. You'll find that in the middle of the screen. Please uh, restrict comments and questions to the subject matter of today's webinar, which as I said, is what Congress needs to know about Judea and Samaria. And uh, I think you'll enjoy the program. My name is Alan Jay. I'm the Acting National Director of Outreach and Engagement here at ZOA like to welcome you and we'll get this uh, show on the road. Zoom at CLA has been going on since we we started this lockdown for COVID and we've had some 25 or 30 webinars. We have featured ambassadors and journalists and authors and politicians and senior staff from ZOA and uh, we continue our mission virtually. Our mission here at ZOA is we've been founded in 1897 at the first Zionist um, council in um, Berns, uh, in Basel, Switzerland, and um, we advocate for Israel and we advocate for the Jewish people uh, through education. We have a center for law and justice, which takes up all causes, primarily on campus issues, but certainly other issues um, pertaining to advocacy for Israel and the Jewish people. You'll hear from our director for um, government government relations, Dan Pollock. I'll intro Dan in a moment. Uh, ZOA has a very, very strong campus department. We're on over 100 campuses, university campuses across the country. I think you'll hear one of our co-sponsors, Josh, speak a little bit about some uh, anti-Semitic issues down your way in, in uh, the Carolinas. Uh, we have fellows on some 40 uh, campuses advocating for Israel and uh, fighting anti-Semitism. We have regional <coughs> We have regional offices across the country. I saw some of my colleagues on the on the call. So I'd like to give a welcome and a shout out to Steve and Stuart and Sharona. Uh, those are three of our executive directors from across the country. We're in the media. Our national uh, ZOA president, Mort Klein, is constantly in the national news and media uh, advocating for a strong, safe, secure Israel, a strong Israel-US relationship. And, um, We'll continue to do that um, for as long as we have to and as long as we can. We don't see any end in sight. And I'm going to let Dan to talk some of the media program we're doing. And for that, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Dan Pollock is the Director of Government Relations for the Zionist Organization of America. He's been with the ZOA since 2007. Dan helps educate members of Congress, their staffs, and other, government, and other government officials on the relationship between the U.S. and Israel, as well as on policy issues relating to the Middle East. Some highlights of Dan's career with ZOA include the fight against the appointment of Chaz Freeman as the chairman of the National Intelligence Council early in the Obama administration, the continuing struggle to prevent Iran from achieving a military nuclear capability, and the effort to get decision makers to understand that the Palestinian Authority has not lived up to any of its commitments in the many agreements it has signed with Israel. Dan was a submarine officer in the U.S. Navy and enjoyed a 25-year career in information technology industry. Before joining ZOA, Dan was an IT executive for Bank of America. Dan shares his knowledge in print media and has appeared even on Al Jazeera television. But before we turn the program over to Dan, I'd like to introduce one of our co-sponsors, the North Carolina Coalition for Israel. ZOA and our co-sponsor NCCI met and worked together when the Durham, North Carolina City Council boycotted police training with Israel. At the time, NCCI board members Josh Ravitch and Amy Rosenthal, husband and wife, awoke to the dangers facing Israel and the Jewish people. Amy and Josh combined their past experiences and skills to co-found the North Carolina Coalition for Israel, a 501c3 nonprofit that educates and advocates for Israel and the Jewish people. ZOA was quite impressed with NCCI's 
efforts, and we've met up with and joined forces again during the ongoing Duke University and University of North Carolina anti-Semitism issues. Josh, would you please tell the audience a little bit more about NCCI and our other co-sponsor, the Raleigh Carey Jewish Community Center, before you turn the program over to Dan. Thank you for that kind introduction, Alan. I appreciate that. And good evening, You're everyone. Welcome. I want to welcome you all to this program on behalf of the North Carolina Coalition for Israel, the NCCI, the Raleigh Carey JCC, and the Zionist Organization of America, ZOA. I also want to start off by offering a few thanks to people who behind the scenes were instrumental in putting this program together. Jamie Allen from the JCC, Bruce and Susan Newman, and from ZOA, of course, Natalie Lazaroff, Enid Roman, and Alan Jay. For those not familiar with the North Carolina Coalition for Israel, our mission is to actively and boldly engage with our community regarding the important contributions of the Jewish state of Israel to improving the world and to actively combat anti-Semitism in all its malevolent forms. We're diverse, grassroots, action-oriented advocates for Israel, boldly standing up against anti-Semitism and lies about Israel. We've set up booths at the Durham and Carborough Farmers Markets to spread facts about the many ways Israel makes our world a better place. We've spoken regularly in front of the Durham City Council, reminding them and the citizens in attendance that anti-Semitism is not acceptable, especially when it comes from elected officials. We protest Linda Sarsour and then go a step beyond by filming her under hostile conditions and posting her most inappropriate statements on Twitter, where they were viewed more than 700,000 times for the world to see her as she really is. ZOA helped our community to combat the Durham City Council boycott of Israeli police, as Alan mentioned. ZOA petitioned when, uh, sorry, when the Durham City Council refused to remedy their harms to our Jewish community, ZOA petitioned them to rescind their boycott. When that effort was met with silence, ZOA prepared an appeal to the Durham Human Relations Commission. When that effort was unsuccessful, the NCCI filed a federal discrimination lawsuit, which is currently working its way through the legal system. We've collaborated with groups in Michigan and throughout the Northeast, addressing issues and sharing best practices. If you wanna take bold action, educating and advocating for Israel and the Jewish people, NCCI may be for you. And without further ado, I give you our speaker, Dan Pollack. Thank you so much, Josh and Amy and Alan for that kind introduction. Uh, I'm going to start with a joke. It's one I've told before, so if you've heard it, I apologize. Turns out that the director of the Israeli National Zoo gets a phone call from the uh, uh, American National Zoo director in Washington, and he says, have you heard a rumor that they have a, a lion and a lamb living in the same cage in Israel? And he wants to know how this could be. So to make a long story short, they go back and forth. The Israelis don't want to give away the secret. Finally, the American zoo director flies to Israel, demands to see the, uh, the head of the zoo in Israel, and demands to know what's going on here. How does this work? And the Israeli tells him, well, it's really very simple. Every morning we put in a new lamb. So this is where you laugh hysterically and we've broken the ice and now we have a funny start. The point of the story is that in the Middle East, Israel's not willing to be the lamb that gets killed and it's going to survive. And that's what a lot of our joint efforts are all about. So let me tell you what I'm gonna talk about today. It's gonna to be about Congress and Judea and Samaria. And we're gonna talk uh, assuming a great deal of knowledge. So I'm gonna go pretty quickly. And that's why we have the questions at the end. If I go too fast, if I skip over something that you didn't understand or don't know, please ask me and I'll tell you. Um, there's a lot of ways that Israel has a claim to Judea and Samaria. And I'm gonna talk about the religious claim, the historical claim, the claim under international law, under diplomacy, under pragmatic considerations. 
Then we're going to talk about the partisan divide in Israel and the sovereignty thing that's currently going on. So that's what we're going to do. That's a lot of material. Um, I'll try to go quickly. Uh, my least favorite aspect of these webinars is when the person speaking tells us all things that we all know. So I'm going to try to tell you things that you may not know and concentrate on those. And there are a few rather shocking things in this presentation, if I say so myself. So the religious one, it's pretty straightforward for the Jewish one. Everyone knows that the uh, land of Israel was promised to the Jewish people in the Torah. Not going to talk much about that. Similarly, the Christian religious perspective is, is really quite similar. It's in the Bible. Uh, every good Christian probably believes that God made a promise to the Jewish people and he doesn't break his promises. The interesting one is in Islamic tradition. Many people are surprised when I tell them that under Islamic tradition, until the very recent past, it was universally acknowledged that the land of Israel belongs to the Jewish people. There's a great article I direct you towards that has the complete narrative of this that appeared in Tablet in March of uh, 2010. The title of it was Allah is a Zionist, and it was written by the, the, one of the leading clerics in Italy, a man named Sheikh Abdul Haji Palazzia, obviously an Italian name. And uh, it's just really very interesting. I'm gonna go into a little bit of details of it. You know, there's three different sources of Islamic jurisprudence. Uh, there's something called the Sunnah, which is like the oral law in Judaism, the oral tradition. And it's taken as a obvious fact by Islamic clerics that believing that Solomon's temple was in Jerusalem is an absolute article of faith for a faithful Muslim. So all this talk that the PLO doesn't acknowledge there was ever a Jewish presence is not in accordance with the traditional Islamic interpretation. Secondly, there's the hadith, which are sayings of the prophet. And in these, they have different uh, weight according to how strong the support is in Islamic jurisprudence that Mohammed actually said them. But there's a quote I'm going to read to you, apologize, from the Hadith. The Prophet Mohammed said, Verily Solomon, son of David, raised Bayit al-Makidis, the first temple, that's the translation of the Arabic, with gold and silver, with rubies and emeralds, and Allah caused human beings and spirits to work under his command. I can go on and on. But it basically says, it talks about the first temple and the second temple until it was destroyed for the second time by an army led by a Roman emperor. This is a saying that Muslims attribute to Muhammad himself. There's more. Uh, I have the, uh, I should have brought it, but it's stuck at my office. That's the bad thing about being in lockdown here. I have a 1924 pamphlet Al Husseini, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, you know, the one that had his picture taken with Hitler. He's a very well known person, the leader of the Arab people from the 20 in, in what was then called Palestine from the 20s uh, up until World War II. And of course, he was a war criminal who cooperated with Hitler. But before that, he printed up a guide for pilgrims visiting Jerusalem. And it says in it, I have a 1924 edition that's been reprinted. And it says, this is a site is one of the oldest in the world. Its sanctity dates from the earliest times. Its identity with the site of Solomon's temple is beyond dispute. This is also the spot on which David built an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So here's one of the Jews greatest enemies acknowledging that both the first and second temples were there. Finally, there's the Koran itself. Uh, I didn't realize this until I started looking into it. One of the surahs of the Koran is the surah of Jonah. And in verse 93, it says, we settled the children of Israel in a beautiful dwelling place and provided for them sustenance 
sustenance of the best. There's another surah called the Children of Israel. That's the name of the entire equivalent of a book of the Quran, the 17th surah. And thereafter we said to the children of Israel, dwell securely in the promised land. And when the last warning will come to pass, we will gather you together in a mingled crowd. So the Quran itself is a Zionist document. We can talk more about that if people have questions. I'm blown away by the fact that it's not better known. Historically, we're called Jews because we come from Judea. That's the origin of our name. 1300 BC in Egypt, when the Jewish people were residing there, there's archaeological evidence of a people called the Habiru. Now, no one knows if these really are the Hebrew, but it's similar name, and they definitely refer to a Semitic group. And it's a, just want to make sure everybody still sees me, something changed. Okay, somebody must have inadvertently shared their picture. Uh, it's not quite to the level of a historical archaeological proof, but it's suggestive. There is archaeological evidence from 1000 BC. Those of you who have been to Israel, I'm sure have been to the city of David, the, the site just outside the city walls, where David's city and the palace that he lived in have been excavated. They're continuing this excavation on an ongoing basis, but there are many historical proofs in that location that there were Jewish people there then. So Judea and Samaria is what we call the kingdoms of the kingdoms of Israel and Judea that's talked about in the Bible. They're there in what we are now calling Judea and Samaria. The Philistines existed at that time, and they were along the coast, where Tel Aviv and all along the coast, that was not the core of the land of the Jewish people. The entire Hanukkah story took place in Judea. Now, following the Bar Kokhba revolt in 135 AD or CE, the Romans spitefully renamed the province instead of calling it Judea, because the Jews had rebelled so much, they purposely called it Philistinia, referring to the Jews' ancient enemies who were, oh, by the way, there was no longer any trace of them. And they were not some kind of an Arab people, they were Greek speakers and from mainland Europe. There were 200 separate Jewish communities in uh, what's now the land of Israel with some trace of a continuous presence through the Middle Ages. Uh, many towns, including Hebron, had a continuous Jewish presence until the Arab Revolt of 1936. Many people don't know the history here. The reason that Hebron is an Arab town is all the Jews were forced to flee in an act of ethnic cleansing, and many were killed in horrible violence during the time the British were overseeing the Holy Land. With the advent of Zionism, most Olim settled in coastal region, leaving overwhelming Arab majorities in the region of Judea and Samaria. But these Arabs, we can talk about it more if anybody has questions, they largely emigrated to the area following the economic buildup of the advent of Zionism. So many people, when they hear about Judea and Samaria, don't realize that the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria only comprise about 3% of the land. Some people say two and a half. It depends how you count. But it's a very small portion. In the current discussion about extending sovereignty, what's on the table is up to 30% of that territory might be placed under Israeli sovereignty. But all of you who have been to Israel know that it's mostly empty. The vast majority of Judea and Samaria is pretty much close to uninhabitable 
but it's not inhabited, whether it's inhabitable or not. And it's what's called Area C in the Oslo Accords, which is under Israeli control, mainly because there are no people living there at all. Why do I talk about this in the context of Congress? Well, Congress is a body of politicians and we're gonna talk more about their approach, but they like simple answers to complex problems. And this is a very complex problem. One of the areas of the problem is international law. Let me just tell you and share with you my own experience with international law. My introduction said I was a submarine officer. And during the time I was in the Navy in the 1980s, the United States only recognized a three mile limit for international waters from the shore. So any ship could go up to three miles away from a shore. Anybody have any idea? If it were interactive, I would ask why it's three miles. It's a very interesting reason. That was the range of a cannon back in the day, days of age of sail when that was an agreed upon distance. That's how far a cannon could shoot. During World War II, many countries changed their international limit to 12 miles. Again, they chose the effective range of a World War II cannon. It was about 12 miles, so you could sink a ship. So you can see the pattern here. The reason that they chose three miles and 12 miles is because that's how far they could enforce that. Now, submarines like I was on weren't vulnerable to Canada. We didn't know we were there. So we, the United States, were very slow to adopt this 12 mile limit. And during the Cold War, I can't speak about any specifics, but it is said that American submarines sometimes came uh, within less than 12 miles of the uh, shores of potential adversaries. And we did intelligence gathering work close into their shores because they had no effective way of stopping us. My point is that international law really is what people can enforce. But some people believe in it. And I want to tell you, unfortunately, it's not a major factor in the actions of states very often. For example, the Polish and German border was moved by more than 100 miles after World War II. And nobody ever accused the victims of this border change, you know, the, the people who did it of, of violating international law. Neither Russia nor Poland has ever been called into account for it. It was done by international consensus. There's a strong case for Jewish ownership under international law. Without getting too technical, when the Ottoman Empire fell in World War I, there was a peace treaty. We just had the 100th anniversary of the San Remo Conference of 1920, where very briefly, all of the borders of what used to be the Ottoman Empire were established. And it was ratified by the League of Nations and all the victors in World War I. It explicitly states that Great Britain should be given custody of what's now Israel and Transjordan, Jordan, uh, with the aim of providing for a homeland for the Jewish people. It explicitly said that political rights were to be granted to the Jews without a loss of civil or religious rights for Muslims. So when people say, why should the Jews control the land? Under international law, it was dictated that only they should have political rights. So when the UN comes into existence in 1945, all the League of Nation mandates were ratified as valid. And everyone who was a member of the UN agreed that those were the rules they were gonna follow. So the partition resolution was approved in 1947. The proposed Arab state, which would have been an extra gift beyond the existing international law of the time was turned down by the Arab side. And that essentially ended their claim of legitimacy under international law. So the status of Judea and Samaria continued to be what it was before under international law. In 19, I, I, mentioned, I neglected to mention that Jordan was established in 1922 by fiat in violation of the terms of the original mandate 
But again, no country had an interest in stopping it. And the Jewish uh, presence, the Zionist presence, were much more concerned about this side of the Jordan River, and it was accepted by everyone. So now it's become de facto acceptable. In 1947, Transjordan, in 1948, as a result of the War of Independence, physically occupied militarily what's now Judea and Samaria and the eastern half of Jerusalem in violation of international law. And it was not recognized by the vast majority of countries. And this is where the name West Bank comes from. Only from Jordan's perspective, they established the name West Bank of the Jordan River as opposed to the East Bank, Transjordan, and they changed the name of their country from Transjordan over the Jordan to Jordan. But it was never legal. Finally, I want to talk about uh, diplomacy and pragmatism. Diplomacy is a common misinterpretation that UN actions become international law, and that's not true. The General Assembly, which is the body of all the countries, has no power under the UN Charter to make any kind of international law. So they can pass whatever General Assembly resolutions they wish. It doesn't have any effect. The Security Council can make binding security directives, but they also don't change international law. They have to be ratified by everyone. So Security Council Resolutions 242 and 338, they're worded very carefully to state that Israel will withdraw from territories that were occupied in the 67 war, not the territories. So secure and recognized boundaries um, are also called out explicitly. Um, subsequent activity by the Israeli government has created some confusion, frankly. Israel certainly has the right to unilaterally give up some of its claims the Camp David Agreement with Egypt did promise to institute autonomy, which is how the Palestinian Authority came into being in some areas of Judea and Samaria. The Oslo Accords implied that there would be self-government for parts of Judea and Samaria, but no agreement rules out continuous Jewish communities being, having their home in Judea and Samaria. There have been a couple of Security Council resolutions, one in the Carter administration and the all too recent one in the Obama administration that did criticize Israel's presence in Judea and Samaria, but that does not constitute international law. Finally, in 2009, Bibi gave a speech, the bar Ilan speech, where he said that Israel's policy will be two states for two peoples. And this is not binding as a matter of law, it's a matter of policy of Israel, and it doesn't change the underlying international law. Let's talk about pragmatic context. There's 390,000 Jews that live in Judea and Samaria, and over 200,000 in Jerusalem over the Green Line. So we're a total of more than 500,000 people in the area we're talking about. Just remember that the Gaza withdrawal that was so painful in 2005 was 8,000 Jews. And each settler was given the equivalent of over $200,000 to make a new home for themselves. Um, it's obvious that that type of solution is not something that could be envisioned for Judea and Samaria. Many of these communities were established in Judea and Samaria because Israel has a housing shortage in pre-67 Israel. It's quite dense, especially in the areas around Jerusalem. Most of the undeveloped land is less desirable in the Negev Desert or in places far from the population centers. Finally, there's an ideological component of the residents in Judea and Samaria. They're basically the kind of people that are on this call, namely people that believe in the Jewish people's destiny is in our ancestral homeland and they won't be just casually moved off of it. So it's a pragmatic fact that has to be taken into account. It's difficult to imagine any Jews being safe in an Arab entity under current conditions. Someday perhaps we'll have peace when that is not true, and then anything could be envisioned, 
if there could be a formula for Jews to live in a place that wasn't under Israeli sovereignty and with safety, but that's certainly not the case now. Finally, I told you I'm a former military person. The defense, the military defense of Israel without the high ground of the Jordan Valley escarpment. From the Jordan River, it goes up to mountains very quickly. That's where Israel's heart of their defense is and listening stations overlooking the territory uh, to the east that could be an axis of invasion. And it's almost impossible to defend Israel without the presence there. And everyone takes for granted Ben-Gurion Airport is right on the green line. It, it was never secure until Israel controlled the territory around it. And it wouldn't be secure if Israel didn't control that territory. I'm not gonna go into more details. The status quo is not unsustainable. People often say that it is. The demographic trends are actually in Israel's favor. It is often stated wrongly that it's not, and we can answer questions about how that is, but the Arab population figures are bogus. They cheat and they count people doubly and they count people who have emigrated. And the actual numbers you've heard are not correct for either the population of Gaza or Judea and Samaria, the Arab figures. So let's talk about the partisan divide on the so-called settlements, Jewish homes in Judea and Samaria. This is where it comes to Congress. You know, congressmen love to have a pat answer to any problem. When you ask a congressman, what is your position on the Middle East? What they really would like to say is it's way too complex. I don't even understand half of it and I have no solution. That is what an honest politician who is present in the Congress would say but that is not something that they're willing to say. It's just not something that we Americans expect our congressmen to admit. They, we don't expect them to admit that they don't know much about a subject. We don't expect them to admit that they don't have a pat solution. And we don't expect them to admit that they're not that interested in the details. So the ones who are interested are often the best supporters of Israel, but sometimes we also have people on the other side who are interested, but interested in seeing Israel destroyed. That's another talk. The ZOA is nonpartisan. I always have to make this point. We're nonpartisan. It sometimes seems like we're partisan because we spend a lot more time criticizing some Democratic members of Congress. But that's about what they say, not that we have a particular desire for one party or the other. Let's keep in mind that Democrats still consider themselves pro-Israel. Last August, as the two most anti-Semitic members of Congress tried to make a trip to what they called Palestine, it didn't work out, they were not allowed in. 72 members of Congress last August visited Israel on a congressional trip, including 42 Democrats. And they went on a fact-finding trip that was very balanced with visits to most, both Ramallah and with context with the Israeli government, but there are counterexamples. And there are many attendees recently from Congress at J Street events. The truth is, is that congressional support for the two-state solution is very soft, the so-called two-state solution. They can get people to pass a resolution saying that, but when you ask the congressman the practical questions about the difficulties of achieving it, they're not very interested in drilling down. And this is actually any complex issue. You'll find the, it's become like a safe harbor in tax law, those of you who are accountants. It's what can you do when you have a tough question? You can say, well, I'm in favor of two states for two peoples. After all, Bibby said that. Why can't a congressman say it and not lose support from either his Jewish constituents or anyone on the other side. But there is a huge partisan difference in support for Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria. And we're seeing that right now during the sovereignty debate. Most Republican members are more sympathetic to Judea and Samaria, but not all. And even some names, uh, the actual number of congressmen, I, I guess this is a mark that I don't do as good a job as I like to think I do, 
but the actual number of congressmen who would match ZOA's position on Judea and Samaria is pretty small, on the order of 10 in the House and just a couple in the Senate. I can only identify two out of 100 members of the Senate who would agree with ZOA's position that there should not be a Palestinian state in the foreseeable future under any circumstances. Palestinian Arab state. I always use the word Arab. Palestinian as an adjective doesn't really mean much by itself. After all, all of us know, if we know history, when the Palestinian soccer team played Australia in 1938, they had a flag with the Star of David. Everyone used to read the Palestinian Post and go to the Palestinian Post Office, and those were all Jewish institutions. So the Trump administration has changed and mixed up the paradigm. And I'm going to stop here in a second and then talk about sovereignty. And it's given us an opportunity. It's not a perfect plan, the President's Peace Plan. It envisions the eventual creation of a Palestinian Arab state, which ZOA and I personally am not in favor of. But um, right now, the discussion is about sovereignty. If you want to find out more about the sovereignty discussion, go to our website. ZOA has an excellent 13 points of kind of common sense truth that explains why sovereignty now is a great idea. The most important point of these is that Israel has to make the decision for itself. It's not annexation. The land already belongs to the Jewish people, as I've tried to explain today. I'm going to stop there and then I'll answer questions uh, on anything at all. If you want questions about sovereignty and the way that goes, I'm going to turn it over to Alan to take the questions. Well, first of all, Dan, thank you so much for your um, erudite insights into um, what Congress needs to know about Judea and Samaria. There are plenty of questions. I will get to those in just a moment. I'm going to take some privilege and ask the first. <clears throat> You are the uh, national director of our uh, government relations department, and you deal with Congress all the time. And my specific question is, what role does the US government actually play in the effort to restore sovereignty? So the US government traditionally has a role in facilitating discussions between Jews and Arabs, both between in the, in the past, Egypt and Israel, Jordan and Israel. But it's always been true that each substantive step forward has always come as a result of direct negotiations between the parties. Uh, for that reason, a lot of people weren't necessarily looking forward to the American peace plan because these peace plans, when put forward by the Americans, have not usually fared very well. The jury's still out on this one. The upside is it takes a different approach and doesn't seek to force concessions on Israel in exchange for nothing. So the good thing about this plan is it invites Arabs and Jews to come together over a four-year period, and it asks Israel to take certain actions, and it allows Israel to extend sovereignty as one of its conditions. So the United States is facilitating the extension of sovereignty. And you have to understand one of the points about sovereignty, if you look at the ZOA's points on our website, is that all of the territory that sovereignty would be extended over, which means making it under Israeli law, are places that no rational Israeli government would ever surrender anyway. So it's not as though any place that is not already going to be part of Israel, if any peace plan ever comes to fruition, is being envisioned as being given to Israel. But the United States is viewing its role as facilitation. It, it, it doesn't, it essentially has a veto. And unfortunately, if President Trump loses the election and President Biden becomes president, the United States would essentially exercise that veto. It's a practical matter. Theoretically, Israel could still extend sovereignty, 
even if the United States government didn't approve, but the relationship between the two countries is so close and the security relationship is so important to Israel that it's almost inconceivable that the United States and Israel could be on a different page with regard to such a basic policy. Thank you. Um, Herschel Elias asks a question. There's a word in the question that I think you'll help um, to explain that ZOA doesn't use, but I'm going to read the question fairly directly. And Herschel asks, if the West Bank is annexed, are the Arabs living there given the right to vote? If not, then we have an apartheid state. And if they are given the right to vote, then what stops them from voting out the Jewish state? I believe I told you not to read that question or anything like, I'm just kidding. There's like three reasons, it's horrible. Every or, time someone says- I just want to mention, let me interrupt you for a minute. I just want everybody in the webinar to know that Dan is not afraid of any questions. So don't listen to him and he's going to give us a very, very strong answer. Anytime anybody uses the word annexation, I'm going to get pushback. I'm going to repeat it. I'm sorry to repeat it. It's not annexation because the meaning of that is very clear. I encourage everyone to look up the word it involves taking land that belongs to someone else. It's not annexation. The other really horrible word in there is apartheid. I got to tell you, any reference to apartheid in Israel is ahistorical and doing damage to the historical memory of the people who suffered under apartheid. And it's just terrible. I had a, a fall when I was in Israel, not this last time, but the time before that. And I had to go to the hospital and my knee had to be x-rayed. I was fine. But while I was waiting in the hospital in Jerusalem, I saw Arab patients being brought in who were sicker than me in the emergency room. And appropriately, they were taken care of by Jewish and Arab doctors before I was and before other Jews were. So anyone who is gonna tell me that that was apartheid in action doesn't know what apartheid was. There weren't even hospitals in South Africa that would treat both blacks and whites. It's just an offensive reference. So I'm offended by that part of the question, but I'm still gonna answer it. The area that is being considered for extending Israeli sovereignty has one thing that makes it special. There are practically no Palestinian Arabs living there. So the question about what will happen with those Palestinian Arabs is one for the Israeli government, not for me. The possibilities are there's a precedent when sovereignty was extended to Jerusalem, most Arab residents, because of nationalistic reasons, chose not to accept Israeli citizenship. So now they are residents of Israel. They have the license plates that just like an Israeli license plate, they have an identity document allowing them to go anywhere in Israel, but they choose not to have the passport with the menorah on it they choose to have a different travel document. And that's one thing that could happen. The other thing that could happen is they could be granted Israeli citizenship because there are so few of them that we're talking about here. We're begging the question on the larger issue. If the rest of Judea and Samaria had a sovereignty extended to it, including the Arab population centers, that's really what your question is. And that isn't being contemplated right now. So I'm gonna punt on the question because no one knows because that isn't something. And when people say, well, I'm dodging the question, how can, this is a, like a three-way hypothetical. Uh, there's no plan to do something like that. If it were a plan, I agree that somebody would have to answer the question, but it's, it's a third degree hypothetical. There's nobody proposing it. And it's so impossible to envision Arabs accepting it that it becomes moot to raise the question. Thank you, Dan. Eric Selkov asks what I'm going to make into a two-part question. He says, I am for sovereignty, but we need to respond to the questions about the Arab-Palestinian rights in Judea and Samaria. And then he asks, doesn't the Trump plan imply that Israel extending sovereignty also implies recognizing a Palestinian state? It turns out that the way the plan is structured, one of the beautiful things about it, the last question, the answer is no. Uh, previous uh, attempts to do peacemaking have had that characteristic. They, you know, you have to commit to various things. What Israel has to commit to, and they've already committed to, is in principle accepting if the Palestinian Arabs 
would agree to demilitarize their state. There's a long list of things, I'm gonna name them, but they would have to agree to stop incitement, stop all support for terrorism, stop paying people who commit terrorism and their families for doing the acts of terror. They would have to stop the names of their schools and summer camps uh, after terrorist figures. There's very specific things. The list goes on and on. It would take much of the rest of our time to really enunciate them all. And after all those things are done, Israel is committed to do two things, to negotiate in good faith with the resulting Arab government. Oh, by the way, they also have to unite with Gaza and do away with Hamas. You know, how, how close is that? But if all these things were done, Israel in good faith would have to make a plan to accept the representatives of the Palestinian people. And there would be a four year period where they would not extend any Jewish communities beyond the 30% envisioned in the sovereignty and not create new facts on the ground in the rest of Judea and Samaria to allow those negotiations to go forward in good faith. So that's what they have to do. And it's a very, it's the most reasonable idea that a peacemaker has had in a long time. Frankly, it's probably still not good enough to result in peace, but it's an idea that's different. So thank you. Uh, Lorene Lipsky asks, given that most of the Trump peace plan team are very pro-Israel Orthodox Jews, why did they even write a potential Palestinian state knowing full well how dangerous that would be to Israel, aside from the fact that it's historically and legally incorrect? Well, there's two different answers to that. One of them is a very cynical one, and I don't necessarily endorse this, that they knew that the Palestinian Arabs would, in the words of Abi Ibn, once again, never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity and would not avail themselves of the conditions that are envisioned. And therefore, uh, it could be that some of the people you're talking about are cynically thinking this is an opportunity for Israel to extend sovereignty and get uh, established new uh, fact in international relationships without paying a huge price. But that's not what I'm going to say. I'm going to say instead that even though someone like Jared Kushner is an Orthodox Jew, he is loyal to the well-being of America and he probably believes that if the Palestinian Arabs would actually fulfill all these conditions, that that would be a real game changer. And we, the ZOA, are a little bit more skeptical about that, but that's okay. You can't, you know, this is a, a good faith, I'm not gonna assume the cynical answer. Uh, Israel is strong enough to negotiate in good faith with and Palestinian Arab delegation, if they should ever send one. Of course, they've completely blown off the possibility of even speaking to the Americans about this. So I hope that answers your question. It's a little bit, I'm not an observant Jew myself, but I understand Jewish law. It's not correct under our law to assume the worst case scenario for someone's motivation. So I'm not gonna do that. Dan, I have at least one more question, but before I get to that, I wanna do two things. I'm going to tell the audience what our upcoming events are at ZOA. Then I'm going to ask Josh if he has any closing comments, and then I'll ask you what will be our final question or two. Um, on Monday at 12 o'clock, that's tomorrow, 12 noon, Sovereignty Now Zoom event with the leaders of Habitonis team, over 1,000 Israeli commanders for Sovereignty Now, and the link will be provided in the chat box. On Tuesday at 11 a.m., presented by ZOA's Greater Philadelphia Chapter, Anti-Israel Media Bias, How to Spot It, What You Can Do About It. Steve Feldman, our Executive Director, will be um, uh, moderating, and the link will be provided in the chat box. And on Wednesday at 1 p.m., ZOA's next book club meeting with Joel Gilbert, discussing Shmuel Katz's book, Lone Wolf, a biography of Vladimir Zev Jabotinsky. That is run by our Director of Special Projects, Liz Burney, who's on this call. Thank you, Liz. Uh, I'd like to offer the floor one more time to... Uh, NCCI board member, Josh Ravitch. If you have any questions or closing remarks, Josh, this would be a great time. And thank you thank for co-sponsoring. You're very welcome. Thank you, Alan. I wanna just thank Dan for a terrific talk and for, for giving us a real font of information. Thank you to ZOA for, for putting on this production. 
And I would encourage people, if, if you're in favor of, of the sovereignty situation and Israel getting sovereignty over these territories, uh, write to President Trump, write to Bibi Netanyahu, and see if we can uh, get this thing moving. That's all I have to say. And thank you all very much. And thanks thank to everybody you. in the audience for coming. Really appreciate and thank it. Thank you to yourself, Josh, to Amy, to NCCI for all the work that you're doing and to the um, Raleigh Carey Jewish Community Center for co-sponsoring. Dan, here comes my last question. I'm gonna roll two questions into this. I hope you're prepared for it. One is there are other, there are other Jewish groups, Jewish advocacy groups in our space, and sometimes their messaging is different. So my question is, um, how do you handle and what do you say to senators and Congress people when our messaging is different than that of other groups in our sphere? And um, if you could close with this, Dan, also could you let people in the audience know what they can do to help you in your work as the Government Relations Director for ZOA? I will. I just wanted to make reference to a chat question. They asked if all of these events that you talked about will be available uh, on video to watch after the fact. And the answer is yes, there's a YouTube ZOA channel, which again, People will put the details of, I'm sure, in the chat. So, Dan, Dan, before you answer, I'm just sorry to do this. I know you got all primed for the answer, but I have one more announcement that's very important, and that is that next Tuesday evening, July 7th at 7 p.m., ZOA Book Club, again hosted by um, ZOA Director of Special Projects, Liz Burney. We are going to be hosting Alan Dershowitz. So everybody, please mark your calendar. We'll put that also in the chat. Sorry to interrupt, Dan. Go ahead. That's good. That sounds exciting. Yeah. So there are other Jewish groups. We have both allies and uh, groups that we don't, that we're usually profoundly disappointed with. Uh, we try to work with them. Um, we try to work with APAC. We try. The, there are big differences between some of these Jewish groups and ZOA. We all are believe in a bipartisan foreign policy. But if you look, I have a whole separate presentation on the the way the Taylor Force Act evolved. And anybody who doesn't know, that's the law that prevents money from going to the Palestinian Authority because of the pay to slay policy of the Palestinian Authority. Uh, it was going to pass and it was going to pass with enough votes and it was gonna be very effective to pull nearly all the funding from the Palestinian Authority if they didn't stop paying people to kill Jews but there were Democratic senators who were important considerations for APAC who would not have voted for it because of their own political base problems. And uh, APAC unfortunately encouraged the watering down of that law with so-called humanitarian exceptions. And that's the way the bill became law. It became much less punitive to the uh, Palestinian Authority and was ultimately ignored by the Palestinian Authority. They agreed to forego that American aid when there was a possibility that we, uh, that we could have uh, had more pressure on them if we had kept the bill in its original state. So we do work with other Jewish organizations. It's a real challenge. A lot of the Jewish groups in town that with all the letters, AJC, ADL, they have other concerns, other issues that have nothing to do with the pro-Israel movement and even uh, being on the wrong side from my point of view. For example, we're not going to talk about Black Lives Matter tonight, but of course we're all revolted by what happened in Minnesota. But if you're going to take a Black Lives Matter position, it's incumbent upon you to call out the actual organization for their anti-Semitism. And unfortunately, we're not seeing other Jewish groups always doing that. Which leads me to what can you do? Uh, it's a real challenge. A lot of times people go through these talks and one of the questions I had, didn't get it today, was, come on, all the things you said that ZOA is doing, they're not gonna really solve these problems. Who are you kidding? That's actually a legitimate question. And the answer is a little bit like, what can people do? And the answer is, you have to all take a look at what you're doing now about something you believe in strongly and evaluate yourself for whether you're doing enough to make a difference. 
We have the example of Amy and Josh in North Carolina, who are not just fuming about what they're seeing in their town, they're doing something about it. And all of you need to be doing that. So what does that mean? If it's a matter of financial support for a group like ZOA, that's something you can do. I mean, we just took out a, a big ad, I'm calling it an ad is an understatement, uh, the side of a hotel with two large banners that really have made a big splash in Israel, saying sovereignty now in Hebrew and English with pictures of uh, various Israeli political figures. It's a very huge, impactful thing. Uh, it costs a lot of money. So if any of you have disposable income, we would like you to consider helping ZOA out. This is, isn't a fundraising call, but it fits in with the question. And the other thing you can do is get involved. Find out what your congressman's stance is and start a correspondence with your congressman's office. Every, every congressman has a foreign policy advisor. You can find the phone number of your congressman on the web very easily. And they take calls, they take emails, and the next time ZOA has a Washington mission, you can participate uh, and physically go down and join our lobbying effort. So this is all tied in with a need for all of us to do what, oh, there's a picture of the uh, ZOA ad. That's not cheap. Anyway, the bottom line is we're fully committed. I'm doing this, you know, I, I used to have a very nice job in a corporate, uh, they used to pay me a bonus every year. And it was a lot of money. And I'm not <laughs> complaining, but that's not what happens at ZOA. I mean, it's a <laughs> different world to work in the nonprofits. And I'm doing whatever I can to help achieve this. I'm not complaining. I love my job. But that's what we all have to do. Take a look in the mirror and decide. Is that is that answer your question, Alan? It does. With that, and, I'm going to... I'm going to end the program. I want to thank you all for participating. I want to just say again, thank you to our uh, co-hosts. And if anyone has any questions that weren't answered today, my email is uh, dpollock, D-P-O-L-L-A-K, at zoa.org. I will endeavor to answer them. I mean, not necessarily tonight, but at a reasonable amount of uh, turnaround time. Thank you all, and, and good night.